the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Welcome to the podcast edition of Maximum Growth Live, the number one program for lawyers who want to grow their practices. Each week, our hosts, Seth Price and Jay Ruane, tackle the fundamental questions about how to grow the profit and profitability of your law firm. To watch the program live, submit your questions and hear the latest episode. Tune in every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern on Facebook for our live show. Maximum Growth Live is a production of Maximum Lawyer Media. Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Maximum Growth Live. I'm doing my shooter, McGavin. My name is Jay Ruane. I'm the CEO of FirmFlex, your social media marketing agency for lawyers, as well as the managing partner of Ruane Attorneys, your civil rights and criminal defense law firm in Connecticut. And with me, once again, my friend down there, uh, no longer in Del Boca Vista, but joining me from near our nation's capital, Seth Jay Price. Seth is the founder of Blue Shark Digital, your SEO firm for lawyers, as well as the managing partner of Price Benowitz, your DC, Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina law firm. I'm waiting to hear when you're going to go into North Carolina so I can make it that whole trek down uh, the Southeast Coast because I don't want you coming up near me, Seth. Seth, how's your week going this week? Going well. Uh, I'm really excited about our guest today. Um, you know, this is somebody who I've been following for quite a while. There was a landmark article a number of years ago in the New York Times, sort of talking about this incredible firm, just you know, less than an hour from where I was, and reached out to uh, to Sheila and sort of was my mind was blown. Things that we talk about today, she was doing 20 years ago, putting systems in place, offshore labor. Uh, creating something where she was no longer, while she was the brand, she was no longer make, doing the sausage making or even the managing. She truly e probably as well as any lawyer we know. So I, I just can't wait to sort of get her insights on her journey. Yeah, you know, I, I, I definitely too. I, I made sure to take it easy yesterday for St. Patrick's Day to make sure that I was focused and able to be present uh, during this conversation today because I didn't want to be dragging having, having had too many uh, uh, shots of Irish mist and a couple of pints of Guinness on, on Patty's Day. But, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about her story, having read uh, parts of her book, um, was that a lot of this stuff, um, even though she went to Harvard, they don't teach you this in Harvard. This is yeah, stuff fact, that nobody had a Harvard go. My uncle was Harvard way back in the day, right? And my dad was Yale. They, their classmates, like, there's like one PI lawyer in their class, and he buys the wine for all their dinners. Like, it is a group that doesn't go into entrepreneurship generally. They may start companies, but they're certainly not, you know, elevating the B two C law firm landscape. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Lawyers tend to be very risk averse. Now, our audience tends to be the opposite of that, right? Our audience tends to be people that are willing to take chances. But there's this part of us as lawyers that gets beaten into us in 1L, 2L a year about you don't take chances. You look at all the options and then somebody else gets to make that decision. And I think it's interesting that of all the law entrepreneurs that I know that are in our audience, that I've met at seminars, that type of thing, I feel like the people that I have met would have been successful small business owners no matter what business they got into. They just happened to pick law because they maybe were steered that way or had some interest that way. But then when they got to law school, 
they said, you know what, the big firm life may not be for me. Uh, okay. And they found I'm, I'm, not, I'm that roadmap, right? I came out, there were no great jobs. The go-go 80s were done. And I grabbed the big firm job so I could check the box. I had no in interest. If I could have written the script all over again, I would never have gone inside of a law firm. My, my job, my, my sort of vision for life was something entrepreneurial. It just happened to be a law firm because of my law partner that we ended up launching. Yeah, it's 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 a really interesting thing, and, and you know, a lot of people. And I, it's I have an attorney who's with me in my office now. Uh, she is a first generation lawyer, first generation college grad, child of immigrants, and she has this incredible mind and entrepreneurial spirit, and yet she has this this battle inside her because we are we're dealing with she's a woman of color uh she's her family are, are immigrants and they have a vision for what a lawyer is and it doesn't comport with her vision for entrepreneurial lawyership i think that's why she found her way to us after going through a number of big firm and, and corporate and and uh, and municipal jobs um and but there's a part of her that says well, I need to fulfill the role that my forebears wanted me to fulfill to honor their sacrifice. And I keep saying to her, you know, I want to pull you into my world of entrepreneurship because you have so much to offer. And it's, I'm really looking forward to this conversation uh, because I think that's something that uh, Sheila found early on was I want to go after what I want to go after. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a remarkable message for all of our listeners. So what do you think? Should we bring her on? Let's do it. All right, we'll be right, both, right back, folks. Let's hear some messages, and when we come back, we'll have Sheila Murthy with our Maximum Growth Live interview. We'll be right back. The lawyers who will succeed in the next decade are the ones who are focusing on building their brands where people meet, and there is no place better to build your brand than on social media. With the FirmFlex DIY social media plan, hundreds of lawyers like you are using social media to build their brand and become the one lawyer in their community that people know, like, and trust. By spending even just five minutes a day on social media marketing, you can engage with hundreds or thousands of people in your local community who will need your services. By cultivating a network of followers, you build a book of business that you can market to the next decade and beyond. If you are looking for a solution to help you jumpstart your social media marketing, look no further than the DIY plan at GetFirmFlex.com. The DIY was created by a small firm lawyer for people just like you, helping you connect with local people online and build your brand and engage people in the topics they want to talk about, all for under $100 a month. To find out more, visit GetFirmFlex.com. Welcome, Sheila Murthy. We're so excited to have you here today. I'm honored so, to join you guys. Sheila, the, the, the lawyer, the entrepreneur, the philanthropist, and, and the recent subject of the book being Sheila, The Life Journey of an Immigration Lawyer. Very exciting and a very fascinating read. Thank you so much. I was very uh, equally surprised that somebody would actually want to write about us lawyers. You know, you're, you're not just any lawyer. And one of the things that I've been following for a long time and why I would love to have you on the show is you have done something with your, with your law firm. And I remember early on when I spoke to you, you said, I don't have a law firm. I have a technology play. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, can you share with the audience a little bit about what you built? You were born in India, emigrated to the U.S., Harvard Law. And, and you know, a lot of people started law firms. Not many people have the Murphy firm. Thank you, Seth, for the opportunity again. So really, I mean, our goal, so sometimes I define the law or explain that it's not really a true law firm in the sense, like you said, it's sort of a quasi social entrepreneurship business, a law firm, a technology company, because one of the main driving forces for me was to educate, enlighten and empower the world on the complex and ever-changing U.S. laws and regulations. And I remember 25, 26, 27 years ago when we were one of the earliest law firms out there on the internet and still the world's most popular legal website. Uh, a lot of people were like, why are you giving away the store for free? Shouldn't you be charging you know, for this advice or information? And my attitude was, look, the internet's going to change the world. 
It's going to change everything. So we might as well continue to empower and be the go-to place that people will trust and respect. And, you know, with hard work and determination and a little bit of vision and listening to other smart people around me, I wish I could say that was all my own brilliant genius, knowing how the internet would change the world, but alas, it wasn't. But it was my openness and willingness to know that I need to get feedback from others who may be way smarter than me. So I think lesson 101 is surround yourself with very smart people who compliment you and who are very different than you and you, who will challenge the way we look at the world and think about things. So we, we get it, right? Giving away content, awesome, becoming the authority. It's a playbook that now seems, of course, but you were like one of the few, first people with the internet to tap into that. Ta walk us through how you built the firm to leverage that and you know how you leverage technology because again two of the things we talk a lot about on this show are leveraging technology and te technology and systems as well as using a global workforce and it seems like you were again decades ahead of your time thank you um so in terms of you know using in what they now call informational marketing um again it was i think so at the end of the day you can be very smart and savvy with business, but you also have to have what I call passion and purpose in life. And so since my passion and purpose was to educate the world, because I suffered going through the immigration process, which you alluded to earlier, being born in India, going through the immigration process with a lawyer in New York whose focus was to make a little more money rather than focusing on helping me and educating me and getting me on my road to success. I just wanted to create a law firm where the focus would be on helping clients, educating and empowering them. And in the process, it's like build it and they will come. It was a little bit of, you know, coming from a good place. What do they say? Intentionality will determine where we go. Uh, and so to a large extent, it was, okay, we're going to educate people and we certainly didn't want to become bankrupt in the process of doing it. We wanted to continue the business. And I don't think we quite realized how big of an impact having name and credibility and honesty and integrity and being the go-to place would become for the firm in terms of having, of course, a Baltimore, Maryland-based presence, a small Seattle office, and then having a team in India with about 35 to 40 people um, in Chennai, India, and in, with liaison offices in Mumbai and uh, Hyderabad in India. And the vision really was, again, if people are stuck at a U.S. consulate somewhere in Asia, for us to wake up at two o'clock at night to answer a consular officer didn't make sense. So how could we do this in a manner that would be beneficial for somebody local, local attorneys there to help the clients, as well as how can we serve, you know, you need two hands to clap. How can they do us help our clients who are stuck there? How can we take care of the immigration within the United States and create this global synergy so that people can work together in a beautiful, brilliant, seamless fashion to get 24 by seven uh, client service. So how did you so talk us through this? You know, you have a Baltimore operation, some people in Seattle, but how did you sort of lay out what's done in the US, what was being done uh, overseas? So all of the work that requires a U.S. lawyer, an admitted lawyer in the United States to practice as a lawyer and a law firm in terms of representing clients, filing the petitions, filing the motions, the appeals. We get a lot of cases with denials from other law firms or requests for evidence RFEs. And so we sort of become the lawyers' lawyers to some extent. And uh, so we take on and file those kinds of petitions and applications and processes in the United States. For people who are stuck in India with visa denials, you don't need a US uh, lawyer for that process because again, you're in a foreign country and those lawyers who are there are lawyers duly admitted and licensed to practice under India and Indian government laws, but they are practicing US immigration law so it's not really a law firm, it's more like back-end operations. But because of the complex nuances of you know, 
cross-continental laws and the Indian government not allowing me as a U.S. citizen to own and operate an operation in India. I had to actually divest myself of the entire ownership of that company years ago, 10, 15 years ago, because going into it, nobody told me about these limitations. And then you're like, oh, my God, I can't own this. So you know what? Let it run on its own steam. Let it do what it will. But it's more back operational support for people stuck there who have legal issues and questions. And now we're even using them or overwhelmed with work here to have them do some of the data entry, scan some of the documents, look at the paperwork for us and input some of that data so that when our staff comes in first thing in the morning, some of that information is already in our database and systems. So before I flip to Jay, you know, one of the things that you've done, and it sounds like you've done it for a while, is you've extracted yourself out of this to almost a chairwoman rather than uh, a, a managing partner. Talk us a little bit about that process and how, how you've gone through that over the years. So that is harder, I think, for most of us as lawyers to give up the control because we're all A-type control freaks. We want to control it till our dying day, even if you're 120 by then, right? Now, for those who are familiar with my life or who are aware of it, I will share a secret. For those who are not aware, for those who are aware, you know it. I'm married to this right-wing creative artist, a professor at the Maryland, who was at the Maryland Institute College of Art, a master in fine arts, long hair, beard. He was a lead drummer in a rock group in college. Uh, so completely different way of looking at the world. So right from the last 15, 20 years, he would say, I don't understand why you're working 16, 18 hours a day. I don't get why you do this. How, when are you going to be focusing on the bigger picture of enjoying life, of being a true teacher, a mentor, a guide? Who's going to be looking at the big picture vision for the firm if you are working from morning to evening like that little, you know, <laughs> animal on the Ferris wheel that keeps going round and round. It's like, when are you going to become a strategic, a visionary, a true leader? And hearing it for a long time, I slowly but surely started to release my tight grip on wanting to control everybody and everything. And like the beauty of life, things we don't control. The minute I stopped micromanaging, the firm actually started to grow faster because now I was able to actually get a bird's eye view instead of having my blinders on and just working my 15 hour days. Uh, so it, some of it came from external stimulus. Some of it was me realizing that I really wouldn't be happy working, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour days, six, seven days a week. And I couldn't see myself doing that when I was, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, it just didn't make sense. So for almost 15 years now, which means in my 40s, I pretty much started to, uh, you know, we, uh, I have a lawyer who's now been with me 21 years, who's the firm's managing a partner, managing attorney, um, Aaron Finkelstein, and I have three assistant managing attorneys who've been with the firm about 15 years each. And part of it, of course, I think, again, another problem, I say a problem because it's a challenge for us as lawyers is retaining talent, keeping people, keeping them engaged and motivated and feeling valued and appreciated. And it's almost a secret recipe that isn't in our DNA. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this. There's a website and a, a, place, a place called thelawyerbrain.com that apparently we are an anomaly. We are the freaks of nature. We are the bell curve in the world so differently than almost every other profession or occupation in the world. And when I started to realize hearing all of these you know, like many people, I did the Myers-Briggs personality test. I heard about this lawyerbrain.com. I, I, I contributed to the book about the lawyer's well-being published by the ABA. I knew that lawyers, brilliant as we are, smart, clever, strategic, we counsel the world, we love solving problems, but we shouldn't become experts in areas we are not intrinsically good at. Our DNA doesn't work for certain things. 
So we need to be able to graciously yield and surround ourselves with people who are very different than us, where the one plus one can become three. It's not easy. It's not easy because again, I come back to us control freaks. So in my case, I knew that this man, my husband loved me and wouldn't make me bankrupt. So if you don't have a spouse in your life or somebody you trust, maybe it's a, uh, a partner in the business, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's an outside consultant firm. I know a lot of people join the organizations where CEOs gather together from different uh, companies and different businesses. It's very good from a networking and other point of view for lawyers to not just put on our blinders and be only with other law firms and lawyers, but go out into the outside world because great cross referrals, business, and understanding business and the law firm more as a business rather than purely as the practice of law, because we kind of straddle a profession and a slash occupation and a business. You know, I've got a question for you about early on in this process. There must have been pushback from other lawyers and maybe even people early on who came to you and, and haven't stayed with you where they said, well, you just can't do it this way. That's not how lawyers work. So I want to talk a little bit about how you were able to overcome that and say, no, 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 I'm going to do it this way. Either come along or get out of the way. Can we talk a little bit about sort of the um, intrinsic uh, cement shoes that most lawyers uh, have, have found themselves wearing that won't let them innovate and iterate like you have? So it's a fantastic analysis and question. I think the trump card that I held and that still is with me is that I continue to be the 100% equity owner of the firm. So to the extent that someone says, you're full of it, Sheila, I don't agree with everything that's going on. I'm like, okay, now remember, I, I could do that or I could say, look, I value why you're saying it. Let's break this down. Let's see what am I missing that you're looking at. And so being completely open. I think someone once said, you know, I am. I tend to be a little bit Pollyanna, a little bit in or, or, sort of la-la land. I don't know what my limitations are or should be because people have said, you know, you have three strikes against you. Do, do you real, realize you're a woman? You're an immigrant, you're a person of color. And I said, oh my God, I had no clue. I thought those would be my three biggest strengths and attributes that would make me successful. So I've always tried to look at the glass of life instead of half empty as half full. I've always said when people have said this, it can't be done this way, or it doesn't make sense, or why would you give the store away for free to say, wait, if other smart people around me think this will work, how, how much do I lose financially and otherwise by giving it a shot for three months, six months, a year? Because initially I was the only law, lawyer in my law firm for the first almost three or four years because I was so nervous about hiring more people because I was convinced that this bubble would burst. I would have no money to feed myself and others. So why bother? So I was almost experimenting. It's like some of those weird people that experiment on medication themselves, I was experimenting to see whether this, what I was doing would actually be an incredible, like a genius of an idea or the dumbest idea that ever happened. And one of the things you will read over and over and over again from the world's most successful entrepreneurs, whether it's the founder of FedEx or founder of, uh, you know, um, the, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, you have in business school, the MBAs will tell you thousands of cases where everybody said to them, you're a moron. If you remember the founder of FedEx in Harvard Business School, the professor said, whatever you do, do not do what you're doing. It's the dumbest idea on the face of this earth to have somebody from Baltimore send a package to Baltimore for it to fly to the middle of the country and then come back out is like sheer nonsense. It's going to be a disaster. But guess what? It worked. And the reason it worked is because there was a deep level of conviction 
and maybe not knowing your limitations and knowing that this possibly couldn't work because a lot of life is on blind faith. A lot of life is trusting each other. I mean, you know, you want to schedule a time to talk with me. How do I know it's not like coming from a really not a great place? We trust the world runs on trust and faith and love and compassion and good things and positive things. And so when I tell you I run Pollyanna, it's like, okay, I truly believe that if you give, if we all give out good karma in the world, the goodness will come back. And so giving out that information, that marketing 20 seven years ago when it was unheard of, answering questions for tens of thousands of people. We had over 10,000 people in a news network digest. Uh, and people were like, why are you answering this? I don't get it. And my attitude was, I'm learning immigration law. I'm learning to use the computer. Before that, I used to use the dictaphone, dictate and had a secretary type for me. And you know what? I just looked at it as it's going to help me. And if I lose everything, you know what? At least I know I gave it a serious shot in life because there'll never be an upside if you don't have a downside. So you have to be willing to take a risk as a business owner, as an entrepreneur. Because if you say, I don't want to risk, then you join a big firm. And by the way, nine out of 10 Harvard lawyers, I would say more than nine, 98 out of 100 Harvard lawyers, don't start law firms, don't become entrepreneurs, no. don't do business because they... They make a very good living. They do very well financially. But again, there's you make a good living, but then there's a completely different level when you are in your own business and an entrepreneur because, you know, you're in a different league all of your own, I think. Oh, surely, surely. I mean, I love the I love the 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 in, incessant optimism because I think as a legal entrepreneur, you need to have that. I haven't ever met any successful legal entrepreneur who doesn't have a natural level of optimism. They wake up every morning very happy. But I want to switch to my favorite topic, which is systems, because you built a systems juggernaut, and I want to talk to you. You know, in the last five years or so, systems have really become a, a buzz word a lot of lawyers there's a lot of products out there for lawyers and business owners to use to document their systems but you were doing it 15 20 years ago so let's talk about that how did you document your systems get buy-in from your people uh, and really develop a systems-based practice it so the technology was evolving the world was changing the internet was expanding uh, computers were getting less expensive. And uh, again, as I keep saying over and over again, may sound like a broken recorder, surround yourself with, with people who challenge you, question you, tell you what you're doing is completely wrong, or at least that you need to look at different ways to do things. And, you know, and they're, if they're willing to put their shoulder to the wheel and be part of that dream and vision to work with you. Uh, so as we were working on systems, so, you know, we slowly evolved, our systems kept growing. It was a very organic growth. It wasn't like, you know, whoops, now here, let's go plong down three, $4 million and buy a new software off the shelf. We did attend the ABA tech show, I remember about 25 years ago, and looked at every software that existed out there for immigration law firms and law firms in general. And we didn't find anything that gave us <laughs> comfort or peace of mind that this would work for our firm. So we said, okay, let's create our own software. And so we started from scratch to completely create a proprietary software in which, again, we've invested a whole bunch of money by having a team both here and in India working on it. So again, we've used global workforce to strategize and again, to be able to work 24 by seven and save costs. Uh, and so we've really evolved slowly but organically making it work as we came across a problem we would say okay how can how, where does this go how does this go across to other teams or departments within the firm that if by plugging this hole will do it should we look at a bigger picture again the bird's eye view on how can we work on this software and i can tell you that after 27 years we continue to tweak it on a daily basis because the laws change the forms change the systems change um, and constantly we are trying to fine-tune the system to make it more a lean mean fighting machine so we can be more efficient and more profitable and provide peace of mind and some you know not have your staff completely overwhelmed and overworked 
So, you know, I would like to say again, I'm this incredible know-it-all visionary that came up with this master plan, but to a large extent, it evolved as the firm grew and evolved, but we were nimble. We were willing to go with the flow and we were open to the idea that this could potentially be something that we need to keep tweaking as we grow. It's funny, I'm sure Jay is smiling because Jay has done just that. When he doesn't see software he likes, he builds it himself. And I didn't see the mark, I didn't see the SEO company I liked out there and built built uh, Blue Shark out of that. You know, the the other obstacle, which is, I mean, again, I'll, I'll just put for, you know, you know, Baltimore, not the easiest place to scale a business. So that that may be your fourth obstacle that you were, you were dealing with. But I want to pivot for a moment into intake. You know, that's something that most of the lawyers on our show have some, you know, have, have you know, that struggled with, but it's one of those areas that you're constantly tweaking and trying to figure figure out how to do better and how to make sure that you have motivated staff that brings people in. I know your brand helped a lot because a lot of people came and they weren't shopping. They said, hey, we know we're coming to the Murphy firm. But what, you know, what did you do to help scale intake across the globe? How did you, how did you, you know, to build the firm you did, you have to have the clients come, come somehow. Um, what were some of the sort of best practices you developed over the years to help bring people from potential client to paying client? So initially, Seth, it was obviously an issue in terms of most people wanted, they were so used to getting everything for free you know, 27 years ago, and nobody paid for somebody that they just found on the internet. And there was also the issue of, like you said, name, reputation, credibility, integrity, you know, how do we know these are not legit? How do we know these are not scam artists that were going to take our money and run away with it? So you build trust one person at a time, one client at a time. But the beauty, of course, of the internet was just as quickly as the bad name can go around, the good name can go around too. And I sort of didn't understand completely the power of multiplication 27 years ago. But as more and more people started getting cases approved, we started seeing the the referrals from them and their family and their friends and their friends' friends and posting on the internet that, hey, this is a law firm and a lawyer you should use because you know she's a Harvard lawyer and she, they, she cares and she'll fight for you. And I am by nature, a, a fighter. Like I think many lawyers have a fighting, you know, in our DNA. Uh, and I love the fact that I don't like hearing no. I love winning for my clients. I don't, I don't like it when I feel the government's trying to pull a fast one and, you know, issue a denial on a case that is either clearly in our favor or certainly there's enough gray area that I think we can, you know, argue a, a point and try to win and fight for the clients. So you get the name and reputation of someone who's proactive, who's caring, who's dedicated, who's going to be a pit bull and not let go. When the government, if the government issued a denial, we would go back and say, well, okay, is it cheaper to file an appeal or cheaper to just file a new case for you so that we'll get you the green card one way or the other? So we did what it took to get to the results of helping the client. And we did it, and I did it purely out of the goodness of my heart because I don't like seeing no and getting denials. I think we have, like most lawyers, we like winning, we like winning for our clients and we like problem solving. And so I used the DNA that works in my favor to build the firm and in areas that I knew I had an Achilles heel and I was very weak in those areas. I surrounded myself with people very different who would compliment me and ask me to look at different aspects or angles of the issue. And the intake system kept again growing and evolving. So we started off very big, you know, overall and then tuned it and fine tuned it and worked on it. And it's still a work in process. It's still a work in progress. We're still continuing. It's a process, a system that's never going to be what do they say? I think once Tom Friedman said that in one of our talks where I was the chair of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, he said, if you say you're finished, then you are finished. You can never, ever be done in life. You're always improving. You're always fine tuning your process and you need to continue. And the, the other thing he, he said, which I completely agree with, is that PQ, persistent quotient, and CQ, curiosity quotient, will always be more important than IQ. Uh, and so, you know, as an immigrant, I think immigrants bring so much. Immigrants can teach Americans so much, just as much as Americans can teach immigrants so much, because you are so open to the world. You're coming to a new country, a new culture. 
even understanding the thick American accent is a challenge on the first time. But just knowing that, you know what? It's such a great country. It's got incredible uh, you know, opportunities. It's the land of milk and honey for most of us from outside. Yet a lot of people here see the problems and the race riots and the tensions. But we from outside sometimes come in with almost, again, this childlike innocence slash ignorance and think that, oh, I can do anything. I'm in this incredible country called the United States of America. So when someone says, here's a hurdle, Sheila, I'm like, what hurdle? That's like fun. That's a challenge. Let's go cross it and then go to the bin. Let's cross the next hill and the next hill and the next mountain and the next mountain. Sheila, I have a, I have a, a question for you. You you successfully scaled uh, to, to a size that many lawyers aspire to and most lawyers can't achieve. Looking back now, do you have a specific hire or category of person or type of job that you hired where you can say, man, if I only hired that person or filled that role two or three years earlier, my life would have been so much easier. Where can people who are looking to scale say, if I'm going to hire, I should hire this person sooner rather than later? What, what's your input on some a question like that? Good question, Jay. So in general, I don't tend to look back and say, oh, I wish, I wish. I try not to because, again, it's the eternal optimist and the person that says, you know what, if I made all those terrible mistakes, those mistakes are what have helped me to become stronger and better today. If I hadn't made those mistakes, I might never have appreciated the importance of retaining people. And talking about the importance of retaining people, especially in law firms, my first, and I shared this in my, my book, in the book that uh, you referred to, the biography on my life by HarperCollins, where I ended up losing three of my four paralegals within a one week period. That was 75% of my law firm walked out at me in the first couple of years of my running it. In the beginning, I always would say, oh, they're lazy, they're incompetent, they're not as driven as motivated, they, they don't buy into my dream. I was basically pointing the finger at them rather than pointing it at myself. The minute I realized that the underlying problem with all those three people wanting to quit was I, me, my, I, me and myself, that, that was the only one person I could blame on the face of this earth, it was very painful, it was very difficult because I had to accept that I was somehow chasing away people because I did not appreciate what they brought to the table, their limitations, their strengths. And if they didn't buy into the vision and mission of the firm and my glorious goal of educating and empowering the world and taking away all these problems, then it's ultimately my fault that I do not sit there and invest the time to share the firm's vision, mission, values, and goal, which now, by the way, we have regular meetings with staff, with new staff, with, with existing attorneys, with paralegals, and I go through rooms. I invest time on human capital because what do they say? The most valuable assets in a law firm walk out every evening when you go home, pre-COVID days. They went back, they could now, now, in a COVID world, most of them can work anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world for whoever treats them right, respects them, and pays them maybe more money. But people don't leave only for money. People leave because they eat, we use the word E-G-O, ego. If you hurt somebody's ego, we don't treat people right, intentionally or unintentionally, doesn't matter. We will lose our best people. And some of the most creative people tend to have super sensitive egos. So if we want to have, so when you say, you know, should I, did I get somebody? Did I not? I will tell you, I did notice initially, and maybe it goes back to the world 27 years ago, uh, Jay and Seth, that very few men were willing to work under a woman 27 years ago because I was young, remember, you know, now I'm in my late 50s. So I was in my 30s, late 30s or, even, or, or early 30s, I guess, or whatever, right? 27, mid 30s. So here's a young woman of color, an immigrant, trying to hire all these, you know, men with experience and people were like, I, I didn't quite understand it. So if you would say what was the one great hire, I've said this to Aaron, 
You know, he was what I would refer to as a baby attorney. He'd been practicing immigration law for five years, but was studying as a student, running, studying, working, and, uh, you know, had a family. And so it was a very good find. And he looked, he's very, he's business savvy, but yet I taught him everything I knew, like a good teacher and a mentor. And, you know, for whatever reason, he decided to, what do they say, hit your wagon onto my cart or hit your cart onto my wagon. You know, he decided to make this a part of his life stream. And once I had that one male, I found other men more willing to join the law firm because I remember when Aaron joined, we were 24 women and he was the first male we hired. Wow. And women uh, law for lawyers didn't, now I think it's more common to say if a woman's running a firm that men are okay to work under a woman. Even now, I think it might not be as common, but certainly 25 years ago, it wasn't a quarter century ago, it wasn't the norm. And so I've said to Aaron that, you know, you are one of the best things that happened. He said, hey, it's the same, it's like a marriage made in heaven. It's, you know, if it's if you can make one plus one three that's the best so he often shares the story about you know with sheila you get what you see you see what you get there's no hidden agenda and so he's more paranoid by nature very more cautious than i am uh, and so he kept waiting for his first six months for the other shoe to drop the proverbial other shoe to drop and then after six months finally said i guess this is who she is and i'm not going to worry about is something terrible going to happen that you're getting what you see? And so, again, as I talk about people completely different from ourselves who compliment us, that's what I would focus on because they make you uncomfortable to some extent because we look at the world so differently, but I know that that one plus one can become three because I surround myself with people who are so different. That's awesome. Well, Sheila, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, the book, which we'll put up, is Being Sheila, The Life Journey of an Immigration Lawyer. What an amazing journey it has been. And uh, we uh, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, It's we'll been an sure. honor and a pleasure. And I really hope we influence and impact a lot of young people to thinking outside the box, to being open and creative and not second guessing themselves. It's a combination of your gut and your mentors and people you surround yourself with. And it's not just the practice of law, because the practice of law is integrally connected with us as human beings. It's enjoying the journey of life as a human being. And I get back to the spirituality of it, because we're not just human beings going through the spiritual experience, but we're spiritual beings going through the human experience. And as lawyers, we truly can solve problems, empower people, help others, and in the process, learn, grow, and become better as lawyers and as human beings. So good luck to everybody. Thank you so Thank much, you so Sheila. Much. That's just a great positive message to end our segment here. And folks, we'll be right back with more Maximum Growth Live. In this world today, if you want to grow your business, you want to grow your firm, you want to take on more cases and make a bigger impact, you have to have a digital blueprint. Statistically, throughout the time that we've been working with Blue Shark Digital, our law firm, the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, grew over 1,400%. Seth and his team have years of experience in this area. Blue Shark is truly a part of the firm, so I don't consider Blue Shark any different than the employees in my office. Hey, it's Becca here. I'm sure you've heard Jim and Tyson mention the Guild on the podcast and in the Facebook group. The Guild is this perfect mix of a community, group coaching, and a mastermind. Guild members get so many benefits, including weekly live events and discounts to all Maximum Lawyer events. Head over to MaximumLawyer.com forward slash the guild to check out all the benefits and watch a few testimonials from current members. So head to MaximumLawyer.com and click on the guild page to join us. Now, let's get back to the episode. Wow, Seth, just, I mean, some really, really interesting stuff there uh, about her journey, and um, I love the positivity. I, she's just got, you know, to having a conversation with her, you can feel the warmth and the positivity ooze out. What were your takeaways? No, and it was, it was fascinating for many of us who are not even as far, I mean, she's further along than most of our audience. The fact that she's figured out all these different things, she figured out how to leverage global labor, 
She figured out systems and software before you could just go buy something. Uh, the idea that she elevated a brand where she went from lawyer to manager and then clearly has elevated herself even beyond that to somebody who can, you know, play chess and move. You know, if there's anybody that we've had on the show who is truly e that uh, I feel like uh, that, that's our guest today. That was that was just awesome. Yeah, it was just really good stuff, really good stuff. So what we're going to do now is we're going to end this week's live show, folks. A uh, couple of cool things for you. Number one, you can always catch us on our own standalone podcast, which is available wherever you get your free podcasts, either on Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon. We are there. It's called Maximum Growth Live. Please subscribe, check us out, give us five stars. We'd love to see your feedback there. Of course, every Tuesday and Thursday, you can catch us here live on Facebook with our Facebook Live show and you can actually go on our Facebook page facebook.com backslash maximum growth live and you can watch any of our prior episodes so if you hear us talking about one that interests you you can watch it on demand at any time of course our show is syndicated through maximum lawyer and the maximum lawyer media family if you're listening on maximum lawyer on their podcast right now I would suggest that you also tune into our podcast on Tuesdays because it's the only place that you can catch our Tuesday show show is on our standalone podcast or of course on the Facebook live page as well but what I'm going to do on the back end of this set is we had a really really interesting conversation this past week and so I'm going to bolt on to the podcast edition of this episode our Tuesday conversation because it gives some people some insight into what goes on every Tuesday on our live show when you and I actually break down and talk about scalability and growth problems that we are having it's a lot more personal of an episode, and I think our audience would certainly be interested in doing it. Of course, you can always tune in to Seth's show, The SEO Insider, if you want to get deeper into digital marketing. Uh, Seth has a weekly show that he puts out uh, where he interviews is the greats in search engine optimization and digital marketing, uh, and that's available to you. And finally, of course, if you're interested in systems and growth, please join our Maximizing Your Law Firm for Growth, systems Systemizing Your Law Firm for Growth uh, Facebook group that's available. And boy, that's a lot of stuff I just threw at them, Seth, but we'll have links in our podcast show notes as well as down below in our live stuff got anything else for me seth uh yeah, you know, i'm excited opening day is opening excited. day is not far away yeah. um uh, opening day for baseball is not far away I you know, know what? Right. it was great like, you know being in florida getting to see a game of spring training sort of you could you could taste it i was watching the uh, caps islanders last night and uh, uh you know seeing that that closed stadium i just can't wait back for 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 live hockey so yes baseball's coming uh, and, uh, you know, I think that we are starting to see the world open up. So, uh, yeah. slowly, but surely, hopefully by, uh, by summer where we have some form of normalcy. Yeah, I think we're going to get there. I mean, the vaccines are rolling out. Connecticut's going to allow a lot more people to get vaccinated soon. And I think by 4th of July, it, we're going to be, you know, back to normal, whatever the new normal well, is. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, and the rest of the South is going to laugh at us and just say, yeah, 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 we've been there for a while, <laughs> but for us stuck in the Northeast, uh, we're, we're, we're almost there. It's the world we live in, folks, and we are Maximum Growth Live. I want to thank you all for being with us, Seth. Thank you for being with me this week. We will see you again on Tuesday, folks. We'll see you. Have a great weekend. Enjoy your life. Get out, get some sun, and bye for now. Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Maximum Growth Live, our Tuesday show. My name is Jay Ruane. I'm the CEO of FirmFlex, a social media marketing agency for lawyers, as well as managing partner of Ruane Attorneys. Here in Connecticut, we do criminal rights, criminal defense, and civil rights. And no matter what I say, Seth, my words are getting all jumbled up. But with me, as always, my man down in the capital area, my man Seth Price, right over there, CEO of Blue Shark Digital, your SEO for law firms, all types of digital marketing, as well as the managing partner of Price Bennett, which is your D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina law firm. Seth you're back up in the uh, in in the Beltway. You're you're uh, you're back in our nation's capital. Things have changed from when you left. Uh, they have. The weather is much colder. How are you doing it this is. week? I, I'm doing okay, but it has been culture shock. The difference between Florida and seeing Georgia, where it's open for business, and the the warmth and people are outside, and you, the, you know, I I you know me. You're, you're the introvert. I'm the extrovert. I love sitting and talking to people. I got to do that. It was an awesome winter. 
And I come back and I drove downtown. I, I had an early dentist appointment. It should have taken 45 minutes. I was there in 20 minutes. It was wow. unbelievable. It is a ghost town. It, it reminds me of the federal government shutdown. There is nothing going on in downtown DC. Florida, there's a rush hour. There's no <laughs> rush hour in DC. And um, it is really, really interesting. We have basically just support staff in the office to make sure mail gets open. But the mayor's order still hasn't been lifted. And we are, you know, again, the suburban offices, they're jamming. But downtown, everybody's still working remote. And Blue Shark, as you know, we turn the keys back. And yeah. uh, that's been fully remote. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm in that position now. I, you know, I ran by all of my people in the office and said, "When do you want to come back?" And pretty much universally, it was, "Do we have to? We're good at home. We like the flow." Uh, and even though a couple of lawyers were like, "I'd like to work out of an office one or two days a week," even they want to be home. You know, for the most part, because uh, they're enjoying, you know, seeing their kids get off the bus having earlier dinners, getting to have a little bit more of a, of a family life. And I think, you know, that's a culture change that's going to come uh, even after we get done with all this stuff and everybody has their vaccines. I think you're going to see more people focusing on how to make their work-life balance work better for them. Um, or, or we don't know. And that's the worst part because well, I know you've been handicapping. I'm trying to handicap future real estate needs. And it, it, it's, it's painful because in Florida, they're just like, F it. They're back, right? So my question is when we are back, it will not be a day. It will not be a week. It'll be months, if not years, before the Northeast really says, because part of it's psychological. I just had a, an issue with a longtime friend where they heard we were down in Florida and what was going on. And it was it, like, people don't appreciate it. There's a, there, there are people, and you know them, you're in the Northeast, where they don't leave their bubble. If you take, if you, it's almost like they have shifted into hermit life. And if you talk about a life that's not that, you are somehow, you know, hurting society. They have no idea there's an entire half of the country that's 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 making me look like, you know, I was the conservative person. People laughed at me that I wanted outdoor meetings. Um, but it is it is something that I don't think it's coming it back quickly. But at some point, you know, the people say that. But a year from now, you may want them back. You may be like, you know what, I love the 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 virtual, but you know what? If I really want to have that culture, I can't create a culture. Whatever it is, there may right. be reason that you sort of that right now our memories are very short, and you may want people back. And then you're like, okay, what do I do about real estate now? The good news is, I think that we're going to have plenty of real estate options for the foreseeable future. Well, I think you're definitely going to find some real estate options because there are some businesses that can really function totally remote, or businesses have gone out of business. I mean, that's that's the reality. I, I mean, I I drive around our corporate complex and we've got you know 10 corporate buildings uh near me and um there's a lot of there's a lot of open parking spaces whereas before there weren't um and, well you can't and, tell if that's because they're closed or if they're if they're remote well i can tell you right now uh, a major corporation had three floors of of one of our buildings and moved out i mean they're uniform right and that's and I the mean, question that's, is that's, just like blue shark Right. So there are people and these guys were playing hardball with our lease even during COVID and the place is still vacant. So who knows? Yeah, I don't know. So speaking of the future and, and where you go, this is something that I wanted to talk about. And we haven't really talked about it uh, recently um, on the show. It's something that I've been talking to you about for years. And it's the concept in a law firm of research and development. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to throw that out there. Let me take a quick break. You'll hear from our sponsors. And when we get back, I want to talk about the role of R&D in our law firms, because I think it dovetails into a question I want to have a conversation with you about, about how do you grow and how do you grow intentionally? So let's take a quick break. We'll hear from our sponsors. And when we get back, we'll be back live with more Maximum Growth Live.
Okay, Seth, we're back, and here's the question I have for you. I'm talking to some of my, some of my friends uh, in the last two weeks, and they are in uh, the the drug business. They were not, not not the drug dealing friends I had when I was in high school and college, but they are professionally chemists that work for chemical companies. Uh, and they were talking about how they were coming up and, and doing their budget for in their de departments R and D and what they want to do. And I said to myself. You know, as a law firm, I'm a business too, but I don't segregate, you know, 3% or 5% a year for something called research and development just to see what's out there. And I'm wondering if you do that. You know, good question. I definitely do it on the marketing side, right? We experiment with stuff, right. whether it be some TikTok or some Instagram. You know, I punch, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm still the anti-social guy because I have not cracked the code, but I definitely on the search side. And part of what I love is we get to experiment with stuff at Price Benowitz, which if it works, becomes blue shark material. It's almost like a comedian. Uh, you know, it, there was always the, um, the, 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 the musician, the Paul Schaefer always talked about, you know, he tries something out on Letterman and if it works, he'd play it for his friend in a bar. You know, yeah. I, I always love that, that sort of analogy, but like, I, I, so I love that piece of it. But the piece that is sort of I've probably gone a little bit overboard with was it's sort of experimentation with different practice groups, if that's what you're going at. And the idea yeah. of like, you know, trying different things out to see, hey, maybe this will work. And it's funny because I give you flack all the time for the J. Ruin idea machine and the and, and the idea that we should be quarantining stuff for X period of time before we roll it out. But I'm probably as guilty as anybody because, you know, I love the fact that we diversified, but it's also you know, it leads to other issues because then you have all these different babies out there and you have to take care of them. And that's, and that's the question. That's the fundamental question that I want us to talk about today is as you want to grow your firm, do you think it is better to double down, triple down, find your vertical and really go all in on that vertical and build that vertical? Or do you think the smart law firm owner, especially knowing what we've gone through in the last 15 months, will start to diversify once they get to sort of critical mass in one particular vertical so that they have other niches that are working um, in case of economic downturn or shifts in the market. What is the right approach to this? Because this is something that a lot of lawyers that are, that are now coming out on the back end having survived something that was monumental, need to start talking about now and budgeting for and planning for and working into the, if you're doing EOS, may you make it one of your rocks per quarter to identify these things. Let's talk about this because I have a feeling our perspectives might be a little bit different. So where, where, where do you come on on this thing? Right. So, in a, you know, what would make the best TV if I said, absolutely, this is the only way to go. And we sort of had the back and forth. But like most things in life, if we're being honest about it and we don't want to be a sensationalist, it depends, it depends, it depends. That said, you know, I, I feel that, you know, mo in moderation, all of these things can work. There is a yeah, but time that's, and that's place. That's what I'm saying, Seth. You can't no, start no, 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 a new no, no, vertical no. in moderation. Understood. Well, yes. Okay. So what I would say I is, first, it depends what you like to do, right? Second, it depends on the appetite for risk and the bandwidth you have to execute. So for myself, I love the idea of diversifying because it's it's nice in the sense that you have ups and downs, you have a cat. I mean, the number of people I've said, hey, you have a plaintiff's practice and a criminal defense practice and you, you, know, you, you know you have cash flow, that's really positive. The downside was there was a point in time where we just did criminal and we could say, oh, we just do criminal, we do nothing else. That's why I've marketed that way. I want the marketing to remain unique. But yeah, I, I would say that if, if, as I reflect and as COVID has shown, I've, I've seen that you, could, you only have so many hours in the day for yourself. So depending on your model and whether or not you're running it, my model was to bring in other people to run those verticals. The downside is you're now betting on somebody beyond your own person. And if it, you control it, so if it's a pardons practice, and even though you may not be the main lawyer on it, your thumb is on it, you know what's going on, and it's a scalable widget because a limited amount of your time and a lot of staff time, God bless. But when it's something that you're going to have to business coach that person and that there are many moving parts or widgets within it, 
and you know something that that I that I've been uh, you know struggling with has been like the immigration practice where there are a lot of different staff members involved, and these people need management and oversight. That's where I don't have any expertise or frankly passion. That may be something that where we step too far. And would have been better off if we had diversified less and I had put the hours into some of those further diversifications into doubling down on PI and criminal. So I like diversification, but I think that they, you can potentially, if it's not a turnkey, you seem very good at identifying areas where it's limited J time because that's, that is the, you know, you have only so much J time. And you have your main core competencies that you want to get your revenue from, and you have your family, and then you have firm oversight and all these other things that that time, I think I took a little too flippantly. And part of it was, I'm going to put a bunch of things out there and see what works. It's not like a two month thing. It could be a five year thing. But- as but, long as it's not losing money. So anyway, I want to hear your thoughts. What's your well, thought on uh, but, this? But see, here's the thing. So, okay, so you are in, let, let, let's go back in a time machine, right? You're, you're a criminal defense practice and you say, you know what? We want to add the area of personal injury or immigration or s- some other type of practice area. Are you doing that when you know you've eked out every dollar from the criminal defense market that's available? Mm-hmm. And if not, yes and why, no. why, why, yeah, why not? But why not? Because you know, if you have a, a set of core competencies, you have a workflow, you have a team that works in that area. Why, why, why walk away from something that is so much easier for you to scale? And say, I want to all of a sudden add another practice. And we saw this during COVID. I saw people who do criminal defense and said, "Now I'm going to open a family law shop because." Family law is going to, there's going to be many more divorces because people are going to be at home. And now I'm going to open up this other shop and that's how I'm going to make things happen. But let's take it if people do that in the best of times when they still have market share to go after. And and it it would seem to me to be fool's errand to try to open up something entirely brand new when you haven't maximized every, squeezed every dollar out of your existing vertical. Look, I, I don't disagree um, in the sense that I, I appreciate that. And that's, I think, solid, good advice. That, But at the same time, I, I think what I'll, I'll, the caveat there is, I don't think you need, there's a, there's a place of diminishing returns where you could squeeze more and that some of it is based on talent. And as you move away from the mothership, let's say Ruane Attorneys was going to end up with New York and eventually New Jersey for criminal. Not crazy. The way you dominated, there was no biggest player in DUI in New York and in Northern Virginia. You could have, with your connections in the college and DUI DLA, you could have expanded your footprint. But as you expand, you need that higher level talent. And as we know, this is when you move outside of of the immediate, uh, you know, over under your thumb. As you do that, the piece that to me is really significant is getting talent that is senior enough that wants to do the work, but is not so entrepreneurial they want to do it themselves. And that's a, that, you know, as you- That's a very small it, segment of the population of lawyers right. that are available. And so, and you met last week, Dane, who's amazing. And if I could clone him, he's making great money. The firm's making great money. He is, you know, they are diamonds in the rough. And I thought, oh, we'll just, and so what I then went to was, hey, almost like the Giants, I know you're a Jets fan, but the Giants drafting concept has historically been until they've been misled for the last decade was we'll take the best player available. And so my attitude was if I saw a rock star that happened to fill one of these holes with the idea being we could then cross refer and there'd be economies of scale and academically that's true. I think the piece that is most important to think about is do do the business models work similarly or are they different? And what I have learned, sort of my my big takeaway here is that from my perspective, things like personal injury, uh, workers comp, med mal, the contingency world is one general widget. There are different pieces of it, but that it has similar cash flow issues, similar client issues, similar staff issues, right? The next piece I'd almost lump together 
is like the family law criminal defense world. I know it's not all flat fee unless you're Lee Rosen on the family's law side, but it's similar. People come in, they have a problem in their time of need. It's generally one person, maybe in some family law cases, you get a second person for bigger cases and same with criminal and bigger cases, but generally it's lower overhead, family law, a little bit higher as far as staff, but it's billable staff versus the final piece, which would be like, let's say the immigration trust and estates component where it is a managed practice. And there are plenty of people, we know so many friends of the show who have crushed it in trust and estates or in family law, but I have found those to be the hardest to comport within the system. And not that there's not a way to make a buck, but they are harder to bring into that same uh, family from the point of view of shared services and the management of it. Like I feel like in criminal, I've cracked the code on how to scale that. And it is a different is a different perspective or skill set in those other areas that seem more at least from my where I sit right now today and my and my growth curve seems more challenging to get the margins compared to doing what you laid out before, which is hey just keep keep you have your widget keep replicating it by geography or level of case or what have you. Yeah, I mean it would just seem to me that you are really giving up great opportunity if all of a sudden you start seeing the grass is greener in other practice areas because as we all know it's not uh, and that every practice area takes a certain amount of intense focus a lot of work a lot of money in some respects uh, to, to ramp that up and it would just seem you know you say to me okay you know in order to start competing you're gonna need probably a, a, a $50,000 investment in SEO. You're going to need to have staff that can do, I mean, we're talking probably to go from zero to passable in a new vertical, you might need to invest $150,000, $200,000 to get up to speed. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to pick up cases along the way, but in order to become sort of the systemized growth oriented law firm that you and I like to have and, and people aspire to, there, there comes an investment in time and, and the opportunity cost. And I'm just saying, hey, if I could take that same money and push it into the, my existing practice areas, yeah. I, could own, I could own them. Well, and Jay, look, this is, I, I just had this life moment because we all do what we like to do, right? You love the systems. If you had tripled down on search marketing, you could have been three times your size. You did very well, nothing wrong with what you did, but you've done what, but with what you've done, you probably have awesome margins because of the systems you've put in place, because of how you've run your mar practice. Me, I love the building and creating, and probably to my detriment, I know at a very cost-effective rate how to build something. So to become the dominant player in a re in a market in DC, particularly outside of criminal and PI, I, I can snap my fingers and make that happen. But I don't have the Jay Ruane discipline or interest in setting up the systems that would eat the ROI from them. And I think that the criminal practice, look, we also have Dave Benowitz, who is a, a juggernaut with legitimacy and best practices. So we had a model and could say to people, hey, nobody works harder than him. People put in there. So with criminal, I was able to replicate it with less hands-on per lawyer because of how we set things up. But the areas that have more moving parts where it takes staff to produce something, it needs a Jay Ruane-esque operations systems person. And if you don't do that, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So for me, I put my systems time into the injuries, into the plaintiff's practice, but I, don't, I have not taken, because it's not what jazzes me, have not put that as much into some of these other areas. And it's shown the margins are less good when you don't, when you, like, again, I can make the phone ring, but the, the, the drive to be as efficient as possible, which I wish I had more Jay Ruane in me, isn't there as much. And probably if I did, I wouldn't be as you know creative on the marketing side. But what you've been able to do, and so it's like the grass, again, grass is always greener. I know that I, you know, it's, it's almost like I can make the phone ring, but how do I 
squeeze the the juice out of the out of the uh, the orange right. to mix two metaphors. And this and this comes from me, you know, reading business magazines for years where they say, you know, your best customer is the customer that you've already sold to, you know, for a Snickers bar or Coca-Cola or whatever product it is that you can replicate. But, you know, for the most part in our industry, your clients are one offs. Right. I mean, I mean, there, there's always the opportunity for a second client or, or a referral from that client. But for the most part, if you have a PI practice or you have a, a criminal practice, even a trust and estates practice hopefully a family law practice, people interact with you once, maybe twice in their life. It's not like you can sell them the same thing every couple of months. And, and so I my, my own thought was, that. hey, if I double down and I really focus on converting as many of the people that, that come to me. And so I just said, you know what, I'm spending extra money on on you know remarketing to people that I've already been to a, you know talking to people and hiring people to help me craft a drip campaign because if I've already paid for them to get to me and they know who I am I want to convert them as best as I can and I don't want to spend money or time or effort thinking about hey I'm going to bring in PI cases because the, the chances of that scaling in a hyper competitive market are very difficult whereas I know I'm already halfway to owning one area uh in, in in one niche and that's the that's the the quandary I, I i'll go right out and tell you i don't think you should diversify i don't think you should build new verticals because all it does is make you build verticals and then either um you, you invest more and more money and you detract from your 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 golden goose the one that's making you the uh, it's taking away your time from that or you're wasting money on something that you don't necessarily have passion about you're doing it just for the money or you're wait, or, or you're taking a, attention away from and allowing people competitors to come up in your golden goose space uh, and and so there I, I to grow your firm I don't think you should be thinking about adding verticals until you know you've squeezed every dollar out of the ones that you have. I'm going to make that statement. And I think that like most things, I don't like extremes. I like diversity. I think that here, from a, look, from an academic business point of view, absolutely. But for the people that diversified and had something other than criminal, they were pretty happy during COVID, right? That there was that there was that diversity. I mean, criminal is what probably the hardest hit of any of these uh, verticals outside of tourism. And, um, you know, it was that, so to me, I, I like, I like it. I get your point, but look, don't, don't follow my model. I may have gone too far in diversity, diversity. I thought, and again, one of the things that I sort of, I bemoan and wish I had, I have, I wish I could do better at is the cross selling within. And because it's amazing, even within our PI clients come back for more PI. I, do we get the occasional criminal client that needs PI? Yes, but not nearly at the rate that academically it should be. So to me, I was counting on a better cross-selling within the practice than I would have than, than what I've seen. You know, I, it, intuitively, I, I, I would have thought it'd be more, but I, I think that that's too extreme a position that, yes, you could get more if you stayed focused, absolutely. But for many people out there, if you can somehow diversify, those are things that'll get you through some of the lean times. And it also depends who you are. You know, you know me well enough. It, it's like it, it gives me an, a, an opportunity to think about something differently. But, you know, look, I think what we're both looking at is the grass is always greener. Did I tell you the story about my neighbor. No. Uh, I don't know if I, if I shared this. So I'm sitting at my, my lawn is objectively not very good. It's historically been a bunch of dirt with some crab grass because the kids rip everything out. And I finally, you know, got got a, a guy who sort of made it look halfway decent, but it was still just adequate. And the lady across our backyard, she, her father-in-law is a, a gardens in his retirement, and their lawn is extraordinary. And she looked over the fence one day, looked at my mediocre lawn, and says, "Oh my God, that's so beautiful! Your, your grass is awesome." And I said, you realize, lady, you're the living embodiment of the grass is always greener. <laughs> I mean, it was literally that, that was it. Like, um, that's where, where it came from. And I, and I feel that, like, yes, you don't want to do it because the grass is always greener. Like, I'm doing criminal. Oh, there's more money in family. I get that. And I agree with you. But I think diversity is not such an awful thing. And while we've seen some people that have focused and, got, and dug really deep into one area and have done very, very well, 
um, and and have built you know really substantial practices. I, I personally believe that the diversity is something that has merit. Uh, it's how it's just a very difficult thing to execute. All right, folks. So that's our opinion when it comes to diversity. We're going to take another quick short break. And when we come back, we're going to wrap up the show. I got something I want to talk to Seth about, about Google My Business. And it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. So stick with us. We'll be right back with more Maximum Growth Live. Okay, we're back here, folks, with the end of the Tuesday show, and there's one thing I want to bring to Seth's attention, and it's something that uh, a friend shared with me, uh, and it was interesting. We talked a lot about Google My Business on this show, and what I found recently will blow your mind. I found a lawyer here in Connecticut who has set up his Google My Business at the post office and called his post office box his unit. So the, so the, the, the law firm is at, you know, the post office address unit six, when it really is going to be maybe a, federal, maybe a federal offense, but that will, we'll, yeah, we'll, you we'll can't use a, a post office for private business like that. So yeah, it definitely is. But Seth, you know, it's a creative way to, to get around the, the, the placement because guess well, what? The post office is literally next door to the courthouse. So he's getting that as, you know, his button yeah. is right where the traffic is okay. to some extent. A couple things. I, I don't think that's your road to riches. And I, I'm actually familiar with this concept, and I'll tell you why. When, um, when Virginia, when I first came into business, the state of Virginia did not allow virtual offices. So what Google ended up hating later, Virginia, was it was against the ethical rules. That is more. They changed that. But so when I started you could not use a, a Regis and follow their ethics laws. But there are a lot of criminal lawyers that didn't want to use their homes. And PO boxes were the one exception you could use. Uh, I think if you're running a real practice, it's not it's not sustainable. Google will, like, I don't know if they're going to flag it because you, you, you have to be able to have a place, but they're surely not going to let that be a multiple office place. So... I don't think it's a road to riches, but it is it's certainly creative. In this case, you know, if as as people go, if you're a competitive market, somebody will go and change that to be a PO box. In which case, it looks kind of ludicrous when somebody's trying to find their lawyer. Yeah, it's just it's just interesting to me. I mean, the place has got 37 Google reviews, so people are actively using this GMB to leave reviews, etc. Uh, but I just think it could it could hurt you long term. Uh, oh, absolutely! I do it, not it, recommend that. <laughs> I um, definitely and. and before we wrap up, I got one other thing uh, for the anti-social lawyer. I've been playing around a bunch with Clubhouse. Uh, I now have two. I, I have two clubs. Uh, oh, they, wow. they they are sanctioned by Clubhouse. Uh, we every um, Tuesday night at seven p.m. the SEO Insider, which is uh, where I bring in different thought leaders in digital search, and we we've had a great conversation in there. It's been a lot of fun. And then on Fridays, I hope you'll join Jay. I set up a, a max growth uh, clubhouse uh, club, and uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation with uh, people outside of our own little fishbowl. Uh, it is amazing how many people listen to our fishbowl. We really appreciate yeah. it. We have when I was traveling through Florida and Georgia, I'd meet people and they're like, "Yeah, I listen to you every week." Uh, and it's certainly we are, we are having an effect. And I figured uh, I will I will try to be slightly less antisocial. Uh, and uh, see see how this new platform treats us. You know, it's funny. It's it's amazing how when you start to travel and your world start to collide. I saw our friends, uh, one of the Jersey guys, Bill Colarulo today, commented on another friend's post, and I'm thinking, how are the two of these people friends, and why are they friends? And it's worlds colliding. Them. And I, I I'm say like, it happens all the time. I'm like, oh my God, how does Bobby know Bill? And how does Bill know Bobby? And what does this mean for me in the middle? And it's blowing my mind. So I, I'm getting yeah, on the phone. I found a law school friend who's in Umansky's circle in Orlando. 
has like doesn't realize that Umansky has this huge national following, and 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 it, and it, it's just like, how do you know Bill? Like everybody knows Bill. Everybody knows Bill. Well, everybody does know you, Seth. That's I mean that's the reality. And one of the things I want to do, in addition to your clubhouse, invite people to join our Systemizing Your Law Firm from Growth Facebook group. We have the group; it's growing every week. We're getting more and more people that are interested in joining. I'm going to be sharing a bunch of systems that I have this week. Uh, I've been putting together some over the last couple of days. Uh, I did some Loom recordings. Just just to sort of walk people through things that you can do uh, actually on social media, some social media systems. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing those in the group in the coming days. Uh, and I would invite kind everybody of to join. The point that I made during during the last segment, which was, you know, when you love something, like clearly this is, you know, you and I need more hobbies. I took up tennis yeah. and I could use a hobby. And, and instead you're uh, creating looms for, uh, for law firm scalability. I yeah, I, that's what I do in my spare time, you know. But I, I swear this this year... Once I, I can get my vaccine starting next week, I am going to start getting out. I'm going to, you know, I, I got the Peloton. I'm riding the bike. I'm going to get back into golf, I think. So I'm just outside getting some fresh air in my lungs. You know, that's uh, that's one of the things I have on my plans for this year. But anyway, folks, I want to thank you for being with us today. As always, you can always catch the show live every Tuesday and Thursday here live on our Facebook page. If you ever have any comments or questions, be sure to give us a message down below or send us a DM. We're happy to talk to you. Throw you, go you through any problems that you might have or any questions you have about growing your law firm. But for now, I am Jay Ruane, CEO of Firm Flex, your social media marketing agency for lawyers. And that guy over there down in Bethesda is my man, Seth Price of Blue Shark Digital, as well as Price Benowitz. And we are Max Growth Live. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you on Thursday. As always, you can syndicate this show on the Maximum Lawyer uh, Media family so you can get them through their podcast, through our podcast, through any of our videos. We try to put as much out there as possible. And please join us on Thursday, on Tuesday, on Tuesday at 7 and on Friday at 1, right? Tuesday at 7 p.m., Friday at 1 p.m. for on Clubhouse, the new social audio app. Uh, and uh, this way we can... Get and, with and, you and, and can I, just, I, I know that we're, we're wrapping up, but I, I'm going to have a la I never have a last word. I'm going to have a last, wor last word okay. today. The thing that I think is worthy of a discussion, perhaps next Tuesday, is Clubhouse, which I'm enjoying and I see interesting value. But I think like all bright, shiny objects need to be used in moderation. And that for most, like I like it here as a platform to talk about ideas globally, but that it's the, for to think it's the road to riches for most B2C lawyers focused on a single geography is it will take a lot of critical mass there oh, yeah. in order for that to work. And so it, it's, it, I don't want to be one of these people like, Hey, clubhouse, it's the, it's the answer to all your, your issues. I think it's an interesting thing, just like Google plus was back in the day. Um, it is almost like an insider marketing in, uh, uh, you know, world, not that there aren't people doing best DUI or, or best plaintiff's practice uh, issues. And there are amazing groups that are popping up, but that as a business development channel, I think that like many things, you have to be worried that the people that are marketing that are good at bringing people in, it may not be in the best interest ROI for your time compared to other activities. And I just want to make sure that just because I'm talking about it, that it is not like, Hey, we got to drop everything. And that's, that's the next you know, thing that you need to go all in on. Yeah, one of the things that I've been really reticent about jumping on Clubhouse is the fact that it that it is time sensitive. You know, if you're on Facebook, you can scroll back three weeks. If you're on Instagram, you can easily go back and look at people who posted pictures seven, eight, nine days ago uh, if you haven't been on it for a while. In Clubhouse, if you're not listening, it's in the ether. It's gone. Now, I'm sure Clubhouse is recording it, but... It, it, you know, it's not something that you can decide to go back on. And quite frankly, listening to something takes a level of attention that blindly scrolling through a feed doesn't. Um, you know, and, I, and I think that's part of the attraction. It takes us back to the days before DVRs, when or when you were listening to the radio and it was a talk radio, and something happened, it was gone. There's a certain excitement that I have not heard since early talk radio with that live host bringing people in, taking callers, that it reminds me of early Larry King. And I think that, that that sort of like old school effect is part of the allure. That said, 
you know, it, you know, it, 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 I'm not sure that this is, again, it is fun to experiment with. I'm trying to be less antisocial at the same time. I just want to make sure that we are putting that caveat that this is not drop everything. And this is the, the there, but if you enjoy it and you want to check it out, why not? Absolutely. So be with us this week on any of our live shows as well as clubhouse. We'll be there for you. But for now, I am Jay Ruane. He is Seth Price. We are Max Growth Live. Bye for now. Have a great week and we'll see you on Thursday. Bye. Thank you for listening to Maximum Growth Live. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes and tune in live on Facebook every Thursday for our live show. For more information, visit Maximum Growth Live on Facebook or MaximumLawyer.com and be sure to share us with your friends.